Hello, Disrupt. Um, I'm really excited to be here today with Megan and AMAC. Um, we have a ton of stuff to get through from tech policy to open government to expanding access to technology. Uh, so let's, let's get right to it. I want to yeah. get through everything. Um, Megan, when you first started out in government, you talked about it feeling like the early days of the internet, when no one really knew what it was going to be, but there was excitement about the potential. And you said it kind of felt like 1997, 1998. Yeah. If we're sticking with that timeline. Where is government at today? Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. Uh, Alex and I were just talking about um, where we were all the way back in 2008 as an industry and the government itself. Uh, so we'll jump into a little bit of stuff we were talking about in a minute. But the, the CTO office, our, our team, our job is to harness the power of data innovation and technology on behalf of the American people. So it's a really broad mandate. And so we're working on tech policy, we're working on modernizing government. You see things like United States Digital Service and 18F and the federal CIO and really this IT shift. And also how do we solve the harder problems there? So we're busy working on all those pieces. What's been really exciting is neither of us had planned to go to government until they came and kind of collected us. It's been incredible, it's an honor to do these jobs. And uh, really wanted to come and encourage people to come in and join because because it's really the beginning of digital government. We were in South Africa for the Open Government Partnership, which is something that the President and Ambassador Power started uh, with seven countries a bunch of years ago. Now it's 70 countries, and we have a digital tech track. People are not only doing Open Government FOIA, those kinds of things, but really sort of sharing code the way Estonia, us, UK, Chile, uh, Kenya, uh, South, South Africa, others are really starting to move in this place where the service delivery and the data science and the data-driven government and the quality of what we can use these incredible governmental budgets and access points for is really going to be realized. And so it does really feel like, you know, that 1997, 98 time around here, maybe in 90, 96 once in a while when it feels really early and we feel really behind. Uh, but we're, we're on that path and we got to IPO this thing, you know, and get to the point where we get what the American people really deserve. Mm -hmm. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously, when it comes to bringing technology into government. And you guys only have three and a half, four more months left. Um, Amic, what are some of the projects that you are rushing to finish before you leave government? Yeah, so so many of this stuff is not just government projects, but it's really what we, as an American people, are trying to get done. So it's everything from cybersecurity, making sure that we're tackling inequality, making sure that we're working hard on some of the uh, more interesting, longer-range things like artificial intelligence. And all of it is stuff that we're like rushing to get done. There's some a, another great thing I would I would raise is some of these policies. We've already rolled out the policies. Now we're in that implementation phase. So the federal source code policy is a great example where we need the help of this audience to really make sure that the pilot program we have in terms of open sourcing more uh, federally uh, funded, federally developed software is successful as we do that pilot program in the next three years. Are there projects that are going to be left unfinished, left for the next administration to take and move forward? Yeah, you know, I think that's the history of our country is kind of the handoff, right, as, it, as each administration comes. And uh, the use of technology and tech innovation is at the core of, like, our, I mean, President Washington started the Army Corps of Engineers before the country was founded. I was just in Boston area, we were driving home, so we were just at John and Abigail Adams' house. I mean, these people, you know, he started the Surgeon General. There, there's so much of a long history of Vannevar Bush with FDR. President Obama, of course, gets the internet and has been just doing an extraordinary job of pulling in, we call it TQ, like IQ and EQ tech skills, all of us coming into government, there's over 400 people who've already come to serve in the United States Digital Service, 18F, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, who are like entrepreneurs and residents across, um, and whole sets of things. There's uh, great um, work. There's also one of my favorite things that's going on is the, um, the Social Security Administration has started doing coding boot camps with the teams. And so we have 110 feds, uh, federal employees, going through coding boot camps right now uh, this fall. New employees are doing four weeks. Um, 
or 12 weeks and current employees doing four weeks, but sort of how do we upgrade everybody's skills? So I'd say the, re the reference there to history, it's a work in progress. So we've started and we set up a lot of amazing things that'll continue, those will grow. You know, Mikey Dickerson, the head of US Digital Service, was just talking about how kind of this Navy SEALs-like team that works together with all of the CIO and other leadership teams in the agencies is now, feels like a real thing and it's scaling. And so how do they now, as we transition, set it up to live for a very long time? which is what they're up to. Yeah. That really um, also brings up the, the sort of three parts of the CTO's job. So part one is definitely that, uh, as Megan was just saying, building that, that capacity building within government and taking a lot of the building blocks that are already there and trying to get them to scale. Right. And then you know, step two, the sort of second part is the, te the tech and other policy issues that come up in government, which are really important. And then sort of number three is making sure that we're capacity building throughout the, the nation to make sure that more and more people have the opportunities that this, this crowd really enjoys. One of the things in the policy arena that's probably worth touching on with this community is something that the President and, and Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough and other gave us as a resource, as a new American resource within the Executive Office of the President's team. There's policy councils like the National Security Council, the Domestic Policy Council, National Economic Council, incredible colleagues leading those. Of course, we are in the Office of Science Technology Policy with the President's Science Advisor, Dr. Holdren. Um, they added an extra policy convening called the Tech Policy Task Force. I'm the chair, Alex is the vice chair. Uh, people like Jason Goldman, Office of Digital Strategy, um, uh, David Recorden, the White House IT teams, USDS with, with uh, Mikey Dickerson, um, the federal CIO, Tony Scott, all the tech folks in the White House team are on this council with our colleagues from NEC and DPC and the other groups. That lets us lead a technical driven conversation like open source, AI, other topics. So we can really drive the best tech a quality that we need and have real engineers that quality in the room as we decide policy. Because we want to make sure that the policy is informed by the best uh, technical skills that our government has and we can reach out to our own communities together with those who know their other topics and really drive the, what, what the American people deserve as the best. Uh, we have those Americans in our country, let's have them in our government yeah. leadership. I mean, you have all these projects that you're working on, the open source, developing tech policy, international collaboration, and we're in the middle of an election right now. Are there any of these projects that you worry about being undone by a future administration or things that um, might not see it through to completion? You know, uh, we, we're so, it's the fourth quarter. The president says, you know, great things happen in the fourth quarter. The Olympics just happened. You know, we have the baton. So we're running as fast as we can. We're not really involved in any way in the election. Um, but this, these topics are so bipartisan, you know, operating more effectively, higher quality service delivery, you know, the kinds of things the U.S. Digital Service team is doing together within the Veterans Administration, for example. You know, now it's gone from 45 minutes to 10 minutes to sign up for healthcare on a beautiful web app that um, isn't you know, impossible for people to use. It's the kinds of quality there. So you know, Congress has been recently doing some work about you know, instantiating USDS and others. So we're pretty confident uh, there's an executive order for the, the Presidential Innovation Fellows who are doing amazing work. You know, they're, they're doing work on, on uh, child welfare. They're doing work in the Department of Transportation across the board. So this is an idea whose time has come as we started. You know, it is the beginning of digital government. That's just going to accelerate. So we're pretty confident that whatever happens, it continues. That's great to hear. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Office of Personnel Management hack that happened last year. 21.5 million records of government employees like yourselves were lost. And you talked about this as a learning experience. What did you learn from this hack? Yeah, so I think the, this is not something that's unique to government. Uh, we've had more and more um, uh, problems with cybersecurity across our industry, across government, across the nonprofit space, and it's something that the president has been focused on. How do we make this better? How do we really get to the next level here? Um, and we rolled out uh, a, a cybersecurity national action plan. We also took some concrete steps. One of the biggest there was proposing in the 2017 budget to uh, make a huge fund, a $3.1 billion revolving fund, to help the federal government be able to get rid of some of the oldest legacy services and move them into 
more modern, more secure services. The, the thing that I would stress there is that um, another thing that we really need to do as a country and really as a world is grow many, many, many more cybersecurity folks. Because if I were to say, great, everybody, all the cybersecurity professionals come join government, that would be really good for government. But then the private sector wouldn't have this, this important talent. So we need to get more cybersecurity professionals all over the place. We also need for that, uh, that talent group to be more diverse. We find that these diverse teams are the best teams, and cybersecurity is one of those places where it's really important to have diverse perspectives to be able to tackle the problem and move, the, and move it forward. Yeah, and I think cybersecurity is one of those issues where technologists feel a little bit of tension or distance with the government. They think that the government is sort of on the opposite side of the table when it comes to cybersecurity, when it comes to encryption. You know, President Obama was at South by Southwest last year, and he talked about um, trying to find a way to make a compromise on encryption and engineer a secure backdoor for encryption so that law enforcement could have access. And this is an issue that technologists have really struggled with. And Obama said that he, it was not something that he had the expertise to design. You have a little bit more engineering expertise. Do you believe it's possible to design a secure encryption backdoor? I think the, the first thing I would say is that the, um, the sort of premise of the question that we're on opposite sides here, I think, is a little bit, uh, is a little bit wrong. The, the government and techies believe that encryption is one of these 21st century marvels. It's, it's one of the only things that, give a, that gives a defender um, this asymmetric ability to be better than an attacker. So that's, that's great. That's something that the government, that even the, the folks that have spoken out on this in law enforcement believe is a really important foundational building block for what we do every day online. The law enforcement community has certainly had many challenges with, uh, with encryption. And as a government, um, our, our, our stance is that we don't think legislation is appropriate at this time. But the, but the issue of what are we doing both as a tech industry and as government to go after the bad guys to make sure that we can still um, protect the country, that's something that there's no disagreement between tech and the government about. That's something that we all think is a good idea. Um, so I think that's, that's how I would come at the problem um, as opposed to so much of the oppositional. One of the things that's great is uh, Secretary Carter will be here. The, the work that's going on with um, bringing the integrating the communities. So uh, the DIUX, the accelerator that the Defense Department has just put here in Silicon Valley, it has a lot of national security and uh, military leadership teams, talent, together with uh, venture capital and serial entrepreneurs and other people bringing that talent together. There's so many topics in the security area. Cyber, encryption are some of them, many others. We need to keep advancing uh, the skills and the quality and the implementation skills across the whole uh, federal government, across law enforcement, across our, our private sector. So having uh, meeting points like that, very important. So he'll probably talk more about that in specific, yeah. but uh, it's one of the areas. And then the other one, I know you have uh, some young women here, part of the Let Girls Learn, uh, the First Ladies uh, Let Girls Build initiative, and they've been working on hackathon and tech, really fabulous stuff. But again, more uh, young men and women, we're gonna be doing computer science for all at the White House, <coughs> excuse me, on uh, Wednesday. How are nine out of 10 parents want coding taught at school? And so the more our kids are in active learning, coding uh, experiences in, in K-12 and at college as we adapt our college curriculums to have much more balanced computer science departments. I mean, this is 21st century literacy. It's what the president's talking about. We want to make sure that all Americans are doing that. And it will deeply affect uh, the quality of cybersecurity if we can broaden and get all the Americans playing on the field. It's just we know that diverse teams are better. Yeah. Do you think that that collaboration between technology and government is the way to go, and that through that collaboration, we're going to find a solution on law enforcement access to encryption? Yeah, I think we're going to find a lot of solutions by doing that. I think it's, it's both maybe technology and government, but also technology in government and tech people, that this idea of a tour of duty, generally, is really important. So, for example, uh, you know, if we were talking in a group, uh, like if we were at a legal conference, and we were talking to colleagues here, and everyone was working in the industry uh, of law in some form, a very large number of this community would have clerked at some point in their career or done something or being pro bono uh, in the nonprofit sector. One of the things that's interesting to us is to see, you know, we are, like I said, in the early days of the internet equivalent on digital government, but to see how far behind we were. 
uh, and where we're coming from in terms of recent tech in the nonprofit sector, in state and local, Code for America, another work there, as well as federal. And how do we get our community to have a tour of duty that we have extraordinary Americans just like law, economics, science, AAAS fellows uh, that, that rotate in government. Let's have the tech folks rotate. Let's have TQ uh, in all the government rooms not to take everyone in and build inside, because we're going to have all our contractors, but more like the Surgeon General. You know, you, the Surgeon General is not doing surgery when they're doing policy in their government, and we get the best people to rotate that. That's what we want to do. We think it'll have an extraordinary effect on both modern service delivery that we're starting to see out of the quality of products that are coming from that kind of approach, policy choices, having tech folks, economists, you know, almost like a faculty of a university deciding policy together, not leaving tech for implementation later, but as part of the architecture. And then this third area that we work on, which is how do you capacity build the American people, you know, through things like tech hire, computer science for all, and also solving hard problems together. And have our community a part of that conversation as part of our, of our career tracks. And this is something that the president, I think, has been, uh, has been great at, which is bringing some of these really strong technical people into government. I have the pleasure of working right next to Ed Felton, one of the experts on cybersecurity and on encryption in general. And it's just a, it's a, it's the, the right way to think about these problems is with a real grounding in the technical realities. Yeah. And you mentioned how important diversity is to this, bringing diverse people into government, bringing diverse students into tech so that they're ready for that path when the time comes. You're the first female CTO. What can you tell our audience about how to improve diversity in their companies? Yeah, I think uh, this is one of the great moonshots you know, of the 21st century, is how are we going to get all of the teams playing and all of the talent? The greatest asset of our country, of course, is our people. And the opportunity to play that whole talent team is there and include people in the opportunity that everybody deserves. But also, a lot of times when people look at diversity and inclusion, they're thinking, almost a charity agenda, like, oh, I need to include you. No, it's actually a deep prosperity. Not only is it right, but it's prosperity, right? So we're seeing companies like Intel and Slack and others really step up and put it in the short list of their priorities and talk about it at every executive meeting um, and really get out there. It comes from leadership deciding this is in the short list. Of course, everyone across the industry has been really pushing on uh, diversity and inclusion as something to do, but a lot of times, if you notice in your company, if all of the leadership has outsourced it to the diversity team, you're not gonna get anywhere. Those people are incredible, but they're your coach and it's your job. Right, so one of the things that we also know is that much of our challenge lives in unconscious and institutional bias. And so what are we gonna to do to change our systems and also do training on ourselves and build technology to help us mitigate? A great example would be in media. So today, if you watch children's television or family television, it's 15 to one boy programmers to girl programmers on screen. Why are we doing that? That's unhelpful. It's, it's, not only, it's not true of the balance even. It's, it's more like five to one or four to one. So how do we give our Hollywood teammates some tools to see the bias that they have? You know, I, got, I was lucky to work in the beginning of smartphones with the team that built the Macintosh with Steve Jobs. That team had, you know, if you look at the photos, seven men and four women, all of the women in the photos are not in the movies and all the men have speaking roles. The only recent one was Joanna Hoffman, uh, who Kate, Kate Winslet just won the Golden Globe for playing her in that Jobs movie. I remember Joanna coming out. She's a physics grad from MIT. She's uh, from Eastern Europe. She's super tough. She was the only one who would spar and really challenge Steve and really move things forward. Uh, her son said, Mom, did you really iron Steve Jobs' shirt? And she said, Jeremy, I've never ironed a shirt in my life except once for you when we were late for something. Oh so God. this like microaggression, unconscious bias that's all around us. Um, you know, the, the line in that movie is about Susan Kerr, who designed all the graphical user interface for the Mac that became Windows that sits in our phones. Uh, the line is, Susan Kerr made the bag. It's just not true. Uh, Catherine Johnson, the new film uh, Hidden Figures is coming out. So we need to fix the public record of the truth. We need to know that black women calculated, a black woman calculated the trajectories for Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission. She's not been in the movies. So we need help from Hollywood, from media, from ourselves, for the Wikipedia record that's not correct. You know, women, Grace Hopper invented coding. Most people don't know that, but they've heard of Edison or they've heard of the Wright brothers. Let's make sure they've heard of Hopper or Carver. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, 
And Amec, you came to the government from Twitter where you really championed free speech as a core value of the platform. And you know, now we have Hillary Clinton talking about Twitter being sort of a birthplace for the alt-right movement and a place where women and minorities are experiencing harassment. Do you, how do you balance free speech with encouraging diversity, with supporting minority candidates who might experience harassment or experience microaggressions as they enter the industry? Yeah, so it's a great question for the five minutes we have left. I can totally <laughs> completely tackle it. Um, the, the, uh, I think it's one of the hardest, um, one of the hardest things we have uh, to deal with as uh, an internet community. We want many, many, many different voices online. We want to, we want to hear from lots of diverse viewpoints. Um, and uh, yet, as Doc uh, Searles uh, wrote in the new, uh, the new clues, um, there's this, this worry that the internet is becoming weaponized. Uh, and it's definitely not something that, uh, as a government, um, there's a lot for us to do there. But, um, but I, it's a, a, a fascinating problem, one that we as an industry have to tackle, um, and not one that I have uh, a ready solution on. There are lots of people doing really good work um, in this space. Uh, but I think that's, it's a really important thing for us to focus on. Yeah. One of the things the vice president has been doing an extraordinary amount of work around uh, It's On Us and things like campus sexual assault and culture change. He was on the Oscar stage uh, with Lady Gaga and others talking about how we need to adapt, we need to change our culture. And it's interesting to juxtapose that with the meeting today in the White House on next generation high schools. And so that included everything from active learning to also emotional intelligence uh, and presentations and work that people are doing really in this country uh, to help our young people get the kind of tools they need to be in, you know, these guys are gonna live 100 years. You know, what are the kind of tools they need to be adaptive, learners, creative, et cetera, to, for the national competitiveness, for the possibilities of the future that include getting along uh, across the board. So um, these are things that we're very mindful of and we're driving hard. A lot of times one of the methods we use is not unlike venture capital, venture catalyzing, where you do scout and scale. You're looking for somebody who's already got solutions to these problems, and you're trying to have them. So an example of that work um, in the area of justice and technology, we found that there were several jurisdictions who were already doing very interesting work with data. And, and so DJ Patil, who's a chief data scientist, has been driving this with his team together with Valerie Jarrett and others on criminal justice reform. An example would be Miami-Dade. They had gone from 7,000 people in prison to 4,900, you know, closed a prison and changed how they were dealing with those with substance abuse disorder and mental health challenges and opened a 12-bed stabilization unit in the hospital. So our un incredible police officers, you know, they have a choice when they have someone in that state to take them to jail or to take them to uh, the emergency room. And so now they have an option. And so of 50,000 calls that 911 and the police were trained on that presented this way, only 109 arrests. So now we have an initiative of them, Camden, New Jersey doing interesting things with data science and solution making and justice that requires all of these tech skills and policy skills, uh, amazing operational skills, police force. Uh, we now have different ways to do this and we have in data-driven justice initiative that the president launched, over 25% of the jurisdictions of the country are now participating in a bi-week peer learning uh, conference call and uh, online community that where they're cross-sharing these great things. So whatever topic it is, whether it's diversity, inclusion, justice, um, and, and learning, et cetera, we can use these new internet network methods to try to uh, bring the different people to the table and solve things faster by scaling the stuff that's working. And it's a great example, too, of the diversity of different areas for which the, uh, the skills of the folks in this room would be really useful to apply. Sort of the, the next step of the Andreessen Software Eats the World is software is sort of eating a bunch of these social problems that we are working on making, making real dents in and we need more technologists to come in on the area that they're passionate about. So not everybody is passionate about criminal justice or some of the other things Megan mentioned, but figure out what you're passionate about and go make a difference in that space. I'm really glad that you brought up open data, actually, because I was hoping we'd get to it. And as Amec mentioned, we're running a little short on time. But um, one of the data sets I think Americans have really craved over the last two years has been data on police killings and uses of force. And you mentioned the Data Justice Initiative. I think when we're looking for this data right now, we're having to look to news outlets like The Guardian who are trying to count these incidences. Can you explain some of the challenges that you've had in releasing this data at the federal level? Yeah, well, one of the great things is there's leadership, again, scout and scale, 
Dallas, uh, the police chief and leadership in Dallas, the leadership in Los Angeles, we're already releasing use of force data, officer involved shooting, sets of data, about 12 data sets. And so we now have over 60 jurisdictions in the police data initiative. This is an open data transparency uh, initiative that goes with data-driven justice. It's more of an enterprise, internal data, uh, cross-sharing. And so now uh, these jurisdictions are committing to opening these data sets and engaging the community, which will include tech folks locally as well as those in this community practice nationally. It was started by two presidential innovation fellows noticing the work that was already going on out in the country and having leadership, police leadership meet each other and realize that they could do that too. So we can build a movement around transparency, inclusion, and the kind of data science that helps us see where real challenges are. And we hope to do that you know, across every topic. Of course, all of us on our phones have amazing weather data and mapping data from US Geological Survey and NOAA. We want to think about every agency as we release, like Census has the Opportunity Project. And they've released a city software developer kit, so opportunity.census.gov. Uh, and great companies like Redfin and Zillow are stepping up to add apps. So Redfin has uh, the block score, and now they have Opportunity Score. Opportunity score is helping you know if you should live in a place, how are the bus routes? What's going on with Head Start? What's going on with jobs here? So we really can bring the most modern thing. It's what the president in his South by Southwest address was, you know, love restaurant delivery apps, let's do that. And I need your help over here. Right. If the tech company could have solved it on our own, you know, it would have. You need the policy and other colleagues, and it's these harder problems that we have to dive together in. Boston just had an opioid hackathon this weekend with their medical tech and all kinds of communities. So let's dive into this stuff with our new methods. Well, I'd love to stay out here and chat with you guys all day. I think we're about to get sheep hooked off stage. But I wanted to ask you one more question. You've spoken about government as a second act. And for all these amazing technologists who have entered the White House over the past few years, what's the third act for you guys? What happens to you in January? We have no, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself, I have no idea. Um, we're uh, sort of heads down focused on completing this last, uh, our, our last part here, the, the, the fourth quarter. Um, and so it's hard to even think about anything else. Uh, I'll take a breath, see my kids more, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, AMAC was talking about a, a recent uh, piece that Amory Slaughter wrote about triathletes. And this idea of techies and others who would flow into the commercial private sector, startups and big companies, whatever, techies who would flow into uh, you know, the government, state, local, federal, UN, we'll be meeting next week, so, or in two weeks, so that's that. And then the nonprofit sort of sector. How do we get people flowing amongst all those areas? I really have always loved working on technology that can improve people's lives and technology that can reduce our impact on the planet, so very aligned with the president's climate work. So I think you know, anything we can do around accelerating all the sectors, as well as making sure that all people, I mean, back to the missing histories, as this film Hidden Figures comes out, Tara G. Henson, who plays Cookie on Empire, amazing actress, is playing Katherine Johnson. And mm -hmm. she said, you know, she grew up uh, in, a, in a very poor community. And had she known, you know, the woman she's playing, had she known that Katherine existed, she might have been a scientist or a techie or other. So let's make sure that we're tapping everybody in through things like tech hire and code boot camps and anything we can do to reach out to everyone to make them creators and makers, which is the president's great hope. Because knowing that the American people always get things done, that's include all of us, and it really makes us, you know, it just changes the whole future for our country and for the world. Well, thank you so much for being here. I think it's, you know, almost an impossible task, but you make me feel hopeful about government. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. And come work in the government. <laughs>